a lot of you requested that you know that I invite someone that is expert in in the in the kernel in the in the operating system kernel um, and you know and 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 so here we go we uh, today we have Matt um, so Matt actually is a performance engineer and Matt has worked on every layer of the software stack from web apps to firmware he's a former Linux kernel maintainer and is currently a software engineer in the core database team at DataStax. Matt, welcome. Hey, thanks for inviting me. Cool. Yeah. Um, so yeah. So 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 actually, uh, hi Matt. And then to all the listeners here, uh, I should say that you know I don't consider myself as an expert <laughs> in Linux kernel performance. So so you know so please be patient. Uh, I might be asking a very basic question sometimes, uh, but. As I said, right, if you want to go deeper in any particular topic, and I certainly will, uh, feel free to request the mic. And I hope, yeah, so so together we will have a very interesting and insightful conversation. So it's, uh, so Matt, it's great to have you. And uh, um, so tell me, tell, tell me how you started with performance optimizations and what do you do at DataStacks? Um, yeah, so... The, the, the way that I got started um, focused on performance, uh, when I moved to um, moved to Intel um, as, as a kernel engineer, and I started looking at some uh, scalability issues in the kernel, which, you know, it's pretty common at, at Intel. They have a lot of, I mean, as, as you know, <laughs> they have a lot of um, projects and, um, you know, reasons to ensure that Linux scales properly on Intel hardware. And so I spent a little bit of time doing that at Intel. Um, I really um, got into performance basically full-time, though, once I joined SUSE, the, the operating system vendor. And then I, there I worked on the, uh, the Linux kernel scheduler pretty much full-time. Um, and so that's such a core, core part of the, the operating system that you know, performance has really got to be at the forefront of your mind for, for everything you do. And so I got very, very accustomed to running, uh, you know, benchmarks and um, trying out new patches from from other uh, other kernel engineers that they suggested, and seeing if they improved performance and, and where they didn't. Suggesting some patches of my own, and basically I've focused on performance ever since then. Um, I'm currently at DataStax, which isn't a, a and uh, they do data uh, distribute databases specifically. They use Apache Cassandra to um, They've got an on-premise product, and they've also got a product in the cloud. So now I've kind of left behind the day-to-day -day, um, kernel development, but still got a heavy focus on performance. And actually, because my background's in kernel engineering, I've kind of become, um, you know, the person that people ask kernel questions to. So I I get to use, which is great because I get to use my my past experiences, but kind of in a new in a new way. Like so, so it's 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 like a virus, right? So I mean, I mean, once you once you uh, you know, once you have your like hands dirty in in the OS kernel, so like, like, like it will never let you back, right? I mean, yeah, 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 for sure. <laughs> right. Uh, just actually, I want to remind that we have a live Discord channel. If you have any questions and you don't want to ask them live, um, or you want me to ask them, then just. Uh, Feel free to go to the Discord channel. Uh, it's actually uh, in the top of uh, of, of my uh, Twitter profile. You will see a, um, a link in one of the top tweets uh, on my on my Twitter page. And then, yeah, thanks, thanks, Chad. We actually we actually have also show notes, so so those will be available uh, after after the show. Maybe like uh, oh, so so they will be av available immediately, but the recording of the show will be will be will be available usually one day after. After the episode, just wanted to say that. Sorry, for, sorry for uh, for for a little uh, interruption. And then, so okay, so Matt, so so now you're you're working at DataStax, which is a distributed database, right? Uh, so I wonder, what are the performance challenges in in your daily work? Yeah, um, that's a good question. I I mainly focus on performance investigations, but then also optimizations too. So as uh, as anybody who works on performance knows, like 
avoiding performance regressions is is a big part of of what you do most of the time. So there's definitely a healthy dose of that where we run you know benchmarks that we have, some based on customer workloads, some based on benchmarks that we've written to to test new features, and um, we ensure that from release to release, performance doesn't degrade for you know some. Then I also um, spend a little bit of time working on optimizations. Currently, what I'm doing is um, we're running um, a, a serverless product, which is cloud uh, cloud native database. Uh, but we're trying to unify um, some of the the old on premise product. I don't say old, you know, previous on premise product, and we still maintain that with the new serverless stuff. And so most of the optimization works I'm doing basically trying to uh, um, pass optimizations into the new product where it makes sense. So I, I, I do like a, a mixture of both at the moment. All right. Okay. So, so, so as I understand, this is like a distributed cloud, cloud database, right? Yeah. So, right. Uh, so I, I wonder like, well, obviously, I, I mean, you know, throughput is, is like super important, but as, as well as latency, right? Mm -hmm. Um, Okay. Well, cool. I mean, I, I can uh, anchor I, that against the, the the kernel stuff. So I, I um, like I said, like I said before, I still get to draw on the kernel performance stuff quite a lot. Um, but the current um, challenges mainly revolve around um, me trying to promote my love of micro benchmarks, which historically at the company we haven't done a huge amount of. I think that's probably true of Apache Cassandra in general. There, there certainly exists exist some micro benchmarks, but I've got a a huge love of them um and i also appreciate like when they can go wrong as well so my current uh campaign i guess is to promote that a bit more oh that's that's great yeah, yeah that's, that's, that's actually interesting and i think we, we will get back to that like um you know how to properly properly benchmark right i mean especially in the cloud uh but let's 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 now talk about you know the operating system performance and and let me ask this question like um so what role does the os play in delivering systems performance yeah so um traditionally uh the operating system is like an arbiter of, of hardware resources so um re requiring um Stuff uh, like you know access to resources is done via the operating system, and so that has a direct on performance. You need to be mindful of that when you're um, writing your application. So I, I'm taking this like from the from the, the database or the application perspective. You know, you the you know how often you're asking the operating system for stuff, um, and then in the cloud you've got issues with like noisy neighbors. So you, you're not the only application running on the hardware. Um, uh, and the cloud's got the added wrinkle that you don't always get transparency for that, right? So you can pretty much guarantee you're not the only app running on the physical machine, but you'd have no no real way of knowing whatever app is running, you know, how much it's affecting you, um, and stuff like that. So that's definitely a, a, a new and sort of interesting problem for the cloud. Sure. Yeah. But 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 uh, okay. So for for uh, for the moment, let's let's maybe. So I, I suggest to focus just you know on a on a single single socket. Like 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 I'm, I think it will be easier for now. Uh, at this point, like you know, to reason about the kernel performance. Like you know, if we abstract all the all this cloud and uh, and 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 uh, so and, and you know, if it, if you think about Linux kernel, it is used in many areas with different performance needs, right? Mm -hmm. And so. Yeah, I mean, in the, in the, for example, in in real time industries, the latency is is important. Uh, and the hand we have uh, giant server applications where it, which serve hundreds of users, and for them throughput is is actually the key metric, right? So I wonder what are the default performance trade offs in the kernel between throughput and latency, and is is there a way uh, for for us to customize it? I don't think I, I don't think there's like a real clear answer to that, like a, a real simple answer to that. Um, <laughs> so definitely the, the kernel, like you said, the kernel is ubiquitous, right? The Linux kernel is, is everywhere. And so the, the job of the kernel developers is really to try and pick default values for various heuristics inside the kernel that have good performance for a wide range of um, wide range of scenarios and use cases. And 
I would say, by by and large, they, it does a pretty good job. You know, there are exceptions, but I would say most of the time it does a pretty solid job. I've got, uh, st- you know, stories of people misconfiguring the kernel, you know, going away from the defaults and then tanking performance. So, um, mm. but, that later, but um, I think that there's not like a clear, I, I don't think that there's a clear trade off between latency and throughput across the board, right? It very, it, it depends on the way you use, uh, the way the application works, you know, how much of a CPU or IO bound workload you have and various bits and pieces like that. Um, most of the, a lot of the pieces are quite tunable. So, the, I mean, if anyone's ever looked at like the, the list of kernel configuration options, it's huge, right? It's, I, I certainly, I don't, I don't know half of them I would have thought. I mean, I don't claim to be a Linux performance expert. I've done a lot of Linux kernel work. Um, but I think experts probably going a bit too far um, because I don't think that anybody could claim to be an expert of the whole thing, right? Certainly nobody claims to be an expert of just the code of the, of the whole of the kernel. You know, that's why there are multiple maintainers and, and specific subsystems just because it's such a huge code base that, you know, no one person knows about all of it. Um, so I, I don't have a really, good, a really good answer for, you know, what is the trade-off between throughput and latency. Um, I will say that I have never worked in like a, a financial trading firm. I've never worked on those platforms, but I know you can get good latency from non-real-time operating systems. So the notion that, you know, like a real-time, like the real-time kernel, for example, um, which has shrunk a lot over the years. Now, most of it's actually in the mainline kernel. Um, if you want low latency, you don't necessarily want the real-time patches. Real-time patches give you predictable latency, right? Which is different. Um, but you can achieve low latency with with mainline kernels and some some uh, you know correct tuning and, and testing. Right. Okay. Yeah. Ju- just wanted to add that uh, there was a recent recent post by uh, by Mark actually on his blog, uh, w- which is here. Hi, Mark. Uh, yeah. So. Uh, and- and so, so, so Mark wrote a post, uh, which I find actually re- re- really interesting. So it's called like a game of low latency. So on, on jebperf.com, I guess that's that's the, the website. Um, so yeah, and, and actually, so so in this post, he's talking like uh, how to, uh, well, uh, well uh, how, how, you know, everything can go wrong um, uh, if you are, if you are like, you know, um, targeting low latency systems and and what obstacles uh, you need to overcome to really achieve that so that that, that, that was a really interesting post I just wanted to to add this re- little remark so 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 Matt can you can you just uh, name uh, like at, at least you know uh, some of the most frequently used uh, tunable parameters of the operating system so in other words how you can tune yeah, I'll if if it's possible at all. I'll tell you what, right? I'll it, can I do like a little bit of a backstory for each tunable because it's, it, like most things, it's kind of specific to the the situation you're in, right? And so, okay, sure, that, yeah. yeah, okay. Um, so the ones that I have repeatedly run into, I think, are probably um, mainly to do with things like CPU frequency, uh, the CPU frequency drivers. I hit this. I hit this all the time when I when I did like kernel development every day, and then recently at Durstacks I hit this problem again. <laughs> so the one of the things that is it, quite well documented, to be fair, but it's definitely something to keep in mind. It's certainly at the top of my mind whenever I'm looking to assess the performance of a, of a system for the first time is uh, which CPU frequency is the platform using, um, which is distinct from the governor. So the governor controls how the, the CPU frequency is is changed, but the driver actually does the talking to the hardware, and so it's it's pretty well established that if you want to like if you want to run benchmarks, for instance, but mainly just any workload you care about stable performance, then you should use the uh, CPU frequency governor. Um, mm-hmm. But that's only like that's half the the problem. The the other half is the driver, which the governor talks to, and the quality of these drivers, is, so it's, it's dependent on the, the CPU manufacturer and then the the um, the BIOS and stuff like that. Um, but the quality of these drivers varies. And when I say quality, what I mean is 
you don't always get so the, the CPU frequency governor doesn't always get the frequency it asks for, um, especially with some of the BIOS directed ones, which is just generally a his, historically I say historically has been a problem with some of the BIOS um, controlled drivers. Um, so that's definitely like one of the all time great tunables, I think, when you work on performance is the CPU frequency driver and the governor setting the governor to performance and ensuring that the driver is doing what you think it's doing. I had, I had a case recently where um, even though we set the performance, the, the, the CPU frequency governor to performance, it didn't pin the CPU frequency. And so it's still being scaled up and down. And this was because of the, the CPU frequency driver that was being used, which basically ignored the requests of the governor and um, requested certain frequencies from the BIOS, which got ignored, and then it would just do whatever it wanted. Um, so that's the top one for me. Um, beyond that, if we're talking about NUMA systems, then you know, being aware of the latency between different NUMA, uh, between different sockets, you're not on a NUMA system, then still you run into issues with like um, CPU migrations. Um, so depending on the workload and how how um, tightly you want to control it, I guess, CPU pinning is something that I frequently look at, which is basically, for those that don't know, fixing your, your application threads to specific CPUs so that they're not allowed to be migrated. And the reason you do this is because the kernel doesn't know how to do this automatically all the time. It has no notion of the way your application is designed. And so what it will try and do is ignorant of that, it will just try and schedule the work across all the CPUs um, in sort of like a, you know, a fair use of the resources. Uh, and sometimes that, that doesn't work very well. You know, sometimes the application developers know much better than the kernel what they need. And for those situations, CPU pinning is a really good, um, a really good tunable. I think to turn on. Um, huge pages. So I know I know that transparent huge pages has a bad rap. I I don't run any tests recently, but as I understood it, it, it got better as development progressed. Uh, but, but like most of the stuff that I think I'm probably going to say in this <laughs> today, um, you know, you've really got to you've got to be good at benchmarking because you've got to test all this stuff, right? Because there's no if if there was a universal like. Uh, list of rules to apply, then we'd all be out of a job. <laughs> Everybody would just do that. And it's, it, I wish it was that simple sometimes, but it's not. And you really got to uh, test what effect the changes have, which is a whole other topic by itself and something I spend quite a lot of time doing. Um, but the transparent huge pages can be pretty good. Uh, huge pages in particular, I've, I've seen some good performance wins when virtualizing a workload. Um, and so benefiting from reduced um, TLB misses and stuff like that because you're using huge pages. So that's that's usually on my list too. Right. Uh, let, let me ask you a ridiculous question, <laughs> okay? So do you think, uh, so is there a hope that sometime we will, we will see, you know, an increase in the default page size above 4K? <laughs> uh, I don't know. I don't know, that's a good question. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, you know, so so you are talking about huge pages, right? Mm -hmm. And I and I just and I just and I just wonder, you know, is is that still make sense, you know, in in twenty twenty one to like to to have the default uh, page size equals to four kilobytes? I mean, maybe it, it makes sense for some microcontrollers, but um, but I'm not, I'm not sure if if that makes sense for modern CPUs. Yeah, I mean, I'm I'm certainly willing to to. Um be asked that question like you know to 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 talk about that 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 idea yeah maybe not um because the problem is fragmentation right like if you have big pages then it's an all or nothing thing you get you can't use the the memory as finely so sort of as, as fine-grained way because you've just got big chunks of uh big allocations and for some workloads maybe that's unacceptable i don't know you, you would really have to benchmark <laughs> That's true. That's true. All right. Um, yeah. Okay. So, uh, so based on your experience, what what are the typical performance problems? Uh, you know, uh, like do you do, in 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 the in the Linux kernel, right? So, do you frequently encounter applications 
that abuse i don't know for example system calls or 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 like use it in the in the wrong way um yeah that's a good one i'm trying to think i i think i'm in a slightly biased position to be honest i i don't think i'm i'm good at i don't have a good read of what applications do in general. Most of the stuff that I look at is pretty well tuned. And I think that's just a, a function of, you know, the, the, the field I hang out in, the, the colleagues that I have, and sort of the things that interest me. Um, I, I can't think of anything that really gets abused. The, the, one thing that, the one thing that I see a lot of is mainly, a, um, is mainly around... Um, I guess you could call it ca cargo cult programming, maybe, you know, so past like historical things that have happened that features have had like bad reputations or somebody has posted some benchmarks for a specific tunable and then that becomes law, right? That becomes like doctrine and then nobody ever um, uses that ever again. Transparent huge pages is, is, is an example of that um, where and there's, there's, there's um, the other one that comes to mind is like changing the the um, oh, I've forgotten the the the, the thing's called the sketch sketch slice, which is like a schedule tunable that decides how you divide up uh, commercial time slices. <laughs> no, sorry, sorry for interrupting you, Matt. I was just having a follow up question with. Um, what do you think of disk I.O.? I mean, the kernel is flushing uh, the dirty blocks to disk drives as soon as it feels good. But it doesn't, it doesn't always match what, uh, say, database wants. The database might have own ideas of when it is safe or when it is really needed to flush data. So do you have any kind of um, issues with that or ideas to improve? Um, I... I don't really have any ideas, to be honest. It's definitely not, I, I agree it's a problem. Um, it's not something I've looked at particularly, though I will say that for, um, I know some databases just take that that um, take that take job away from the kernel, right? So a lot of databases actually implement their own page cache. So they map things directly and do their own management of when things get synced. Basically, for the, for the exact reason that you talk about, right, is that sometimes the kernel just doesn't get this right, um, doesn't make correct decisions on it. I honestly don't have a, a solution for that. Um, but it's, that's nothing I've really looked at. But you're right, there is a problem. And from what I've seen, normally, operate, uh, databases will basically re-implement the page cache. Yeah, I, I just heard that uh, PostgreSQL doesn't implement uh, their own page cache and they just offload the, the thing to kernel. And then there is kind of impedance mismatch when a single page write might get stalled by kernel writing, uh, I don't know, the buffer which was collected for a while. So th th there was a discussion uh, if uh, there were a bad interface, but I, I have not really seen the, um, the consequences, so I just wanted to know if you have any uh, tunables there for I.O. with Java or C applications. Not really. Um, apart from, I, I, I know there are ones that, if, if you Google, I know that some of this is tunable. Um, so if you would search and search in for it, I'm sure some things will be turned up. Um, like I say, it's not something I've really looked at, though I appreciate that it is a problem. Maybe maybe doing your own page cache management is, is the solution. I don't know. Um, I just know that's quite a popular technique for getting around this. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, and by the way, uh, when they implement page cache, they only try to use memory, memory mapped files, right? Or memory mapped API for accessing the storage. However, uh, in case of a page fold, it may take a while for the thing to process. Are there any uh, uh, APIs which are in between? Like, I don't know, asynchronous a memory mapped API. Is there, is there really a thing? Yeah, so it, 
definitely memory mapping the files is not required. Um, you know, you can do calls on it without having to to, to memory map it um, because there's issues with with memory mapping stuff, right? Like inside the kernel, it's implemented with um, is it the MMAP semaphore or something. Basically, there's locks inside the kernel that make this not scale particularly well if you have large machines. And so you don't have to memory map files. There are ways to do it. Uh, there are system calls to use uh, so you don't have to do that. Which I think some of the you know some high performance databases actually do. They 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 don't memory map it. They um, I forgot the name of the system calls now, but they they use other system calls for it. Oh, thank you. And one more regarding the mapping. Uh, in Java, there is a ZJC garbage collector, which mm -hmm. uses a fancy um, fancy way of uh, remapping or like always remapping the pages. So it maps the same kind of pages multiple times. And it uses to reduce uh, the poses. Do you think it is an overuse or abuse of the kernel? What do you think of it? No, I, I think um, so. You, you're saying that there are multiple mappings for a single page. Oh, you know that exactly. Yeah. No, no that, that's exactly what the, the operating system was designed for. That's that's a very um, thrifty use of, of memory. Um, I don't think that's a misuse at all. I think that's exactly what it, you're supposed to do with it. All right. Uh, so, so Matt. So, uh, let's go back maybe to 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 other uh, like you know performance uh, problems inside the kernel. Like uh, anything, anything else that comes to your mind about you know abusing uh, Linux uh, kernel. And, and, and actually, I I would love to hear your uh, your uh, performance debugging stories if you if you if if you have them. Yeah. Um, sorry. What was the first question again? <laughs> Oh, so so I mean, just uh, you know, continuing, continuing exploring the ways how you can abuse the, the the kernel. Um, so uh, have any any like uh, you know performance debugging stories, um, that you want to share? Uh, that you any you know kind of strange problems that you uh, in investigated in the past? Yeah, sure. Um, I can do, I can do a couple. Um, so when when the AMD Epic chips came out. Um, I was working at SUSE at the time and there was a book report, I think on the, on the maybe on the kernel mail list. Um, it could have been internal to SUSE, I can't remember. But basically the the AMD Epic machines, they were the two socket um, servers with I think probably 64 because CPUs. Um, so that's um, you know, 32 32 cores, hyper-threaded, um, and so I think, some, yeah, it was either 64 or 128, I can't remember, but the point was that when they ran the latest kernel, they would see all of their tasks bunched up onto one socket, and the other socket pretty much completely idle, which is weird, and if you haven't taken steps to to configure that, it's really is almost always not not what you want it to do, right? The kernel is supposed to be good at basically fairly sharing the resources between the work. And because it was scheduled related, I got to look at that. Um, and after a little bit of digging, that turned out to be a, con a magic number inside of the kernel that didn't work well for the, the AMD Epic machines. Um, the magic number was to do with the cost of moving a task across sockets. Um, the the way that that's calculated, so so the, the magic number was like twenty or something, and what that was um, checked against was basically the um, the ACPI slit tables, which give you a it, it's not directly a latency number, but it's supposed to be some representation of the cost of a memory access between NUMA nodes. And the AMD Epic was the first platform, or at least first of the major platforms, to run Linux where they changed these ACPI slit tables. So for like a decade, like 10 years, every manufacturer had basically used the same numbers, I think, or at least numbers below um, like 20 or something. Um, and then 
the AMD Epic chip came out, and suddenly they, because of the way that the CPU is configured and the way the NUMA nodes work, the cost was slightly higher. Not like you know a magnitude, order of magnitude higher, but just like one or two digits higher, or something like that. And then this check inside the inside the scheduler for deciding whether or not it was cost efficient to move tasks across socket basically always failed. It was always false. And so what you would get is no matter what workload you apply to the machine, one of your sockets would be completely idle. And the magic number inside the kernel was based on a 10-year-old um, machine, like server machine, where they pulled the SLIT table, the slit tables, the values out of that, and kind of gone, yeah, this makes sense. You know, let's just, if it's less than 20, right, then that's too expensive. And we shouldn't, we shouldn't move the task socket because we'll incur all kinds of cash misses. It's just going to be, uh, it's going to slow down performance too much. But then nobody touched that for like a decade. And then 10 years later, AMD released a, 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 a chip with a seemingly innocuous change to the slit tables. Like it's almost like the, the, the connection between the two, the two things. So the updated slit tables and then the, the tunable inside the scheduler there's not like a really strong link there, right? Like it's kind of on a tangent. And after a few days, I mean, I found out, you know, why that was. And the, the fix was just to bump the magic number a little bit. Um, so yeah, that was, that was a fun one. Oh, that's funny. Okay. Um, another one that I had, um, I, I think probably the, the, maybe the best book. I think the, the best performance issue, I, the one that was the most fun that I ever worked on was um, one of the micro benchmarks that we ran at SUSE as part of, like, as part of the release for releasing the SUSE products. We would run like a bunch of macro benchmarks and micro benchmarks. And one of the micro benchmarks, which tested the the time to zero a page in the kernel, I think it, I think it was, because that's used in like a, a bunch of places like forking new threads. Um, the time to zero a page inside the kernel went up by like a significant amount, like you know double digit percentage increase um, in one of the when moving kernel versions. So we 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 were moving releasing a brand new series of. Um, product in one of the product lines that was based on a new kernel version and we noticed this regression in the micro benchmark and working with one of the, my colleagues at SUSE we narrowed it down to a set of assembly instructions because the zero page has got to be super fast it, it's, it's implemented in assembly in the kernel um, and we narrowed it down to a set of instructions that had been changed between these kernel versions and I, for the life of me, could not work out why why it would cause such a performance regression. I read um, uops.info, you know, I, I read all the, the data sheet information I could get on the instructions, and I just sim I just could not figure it out. But then I, I perseverance is like a really important trait, I think, for any performance investigation. I had, I had a conversation at work recently, and like, when you have a difficult problem, the only thing you really need, apart from like a, a, a maybe a strong background in performance engineering, is like determination to keep going, even when you don't know what the answer is. And I had no idea what was causing this. But I did notice that it only happened on a certain generation of Intel CPUs. Um, and what 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 I could see from so as the generation so from like Haswell up to Skylake, it was like a certain value. The Skylake it increased, I think. And then after that, maybe um, Comet Lake or KV Lake or something, it came down again. Uh, and I, I, I couldn't work out why. And after a while, I used the, uh, I, used, I used Perf and I used the CPU um, performance counters to look at the, uh, the LSD, uh, which I completely don't remember where it's something stream detector loop loop stream detector is it anyway yeah. yeah um and i finally found that if i ran on different generations the values for the sd were completely different in fact the ones where the regression occurred um it was zero and what i discovered was that it was actually disabled so this part of the cpu is disabled in the microcode 
um, for some of the later generation CPUs, and which I don't know if it was ever documented, um, but I was just I was just more fascinated that this micro benchmark actually detected it, right? So it, it could actually detect a change in the CPU. Um, and of course, the instructions affected the way the loops were done. And once I realized that, it, it all kind of made sense. And we reverted the change, which looked totally innocuous, we reverted the change and got the performance back. And I think that was probably the best, the most interesting performance issue I, I've, ever, I've ever done. Oh, that's cool, and I and I and I love how you how you said about determination because I think yeah, so you know, d discovering that kind of you know low level performance uh, issue even even when you are not working you know on that kind of uh, low level stuff every day, it it requires a lot of you know determination. I can I can see how it uh, how how it plays here, right? Uh, so Mark, uh, you wanted to to add something? No, I was just gonna uh, throw in that. Someone asked a question earlier about if you have any general ideas about how to tune a kernel uh, for low latency. Matt, not too long ago, uh, resent an article on his own page about something he wrote a year ago about reducing noise using task as isolation. Uh, so if you go to his page, you'll see a link to that article. And uh, after he posted that article, I replied to him saying that, Everyone in high frequency trading, that's a the a necessary steps that we all take to reduce the noise in the operating system. So for anyone who's interested in that kind of uh, tuning for the operating system, go to his article from May 3rd, 2020. It's called Reducing Noise in a Linux Kernel Using Task Isolation. Hey, thanks, Mark. Thanks for that shout out. <laughs> Yeah, thanks. All right. So, so Matt, now, but if we if we, if we now go back, like, uh, and and let's consider not a, not a, a very well tuned, let's say, application, but uh, you know, uh, mainstream some you know application. Um, uh, so, how do you how do you uh, how do you find if if some application is abusing the system call, for example, or any any other kernel feature? And and how do you find where does it happens? Okay, um, I think I don't know if this is this is the answer you you wanted, but um, I, for me, all investigations start from a really high level. Um, so to get to that point, I'd have I would have had to have done some kind of analysis on the workload or the system. You know how the system is behaving, um, and the reason I say that is because if if I couldn't detect it, right, then I probably wouldn't even consider it to be abuse. So it, for me, a necessary prerequisite is like, if I've looked at MP stat, so MP stat is system uh, admin utility. It's always my go-to um, tool. If I, if I don't have like, sometimes we have dashboards, you know, Grafana with, um, percentage of CPU time misspent, idle time, things like that. But if I don't have that, then MP stat is always my go-to tool for stuff like this. And so if, so let's assume I saw like a system time for the platform as a whole above like 10%. 10% for many workloads is kind of, I would say standard. I, I would always use um, perf. So if, if I see, if I see any kind of CPU time at all, I will always use perf to see what the kernel's doing, just in case it's you know something surprising. And so perf would always turn up abuses of system calls and stuff like that. Um, and if it's above ten percent, then it's almost certainly something that needs tuning because that you know the operating system is supposed to be a uh, supporting cast, I guess, for, for the, you know, the leading role, which is the application. And if it's anything above that, I mean, there are always exceptions, right? But I think in, if you want like a general answer, I would say if you see a lot of system time being spent when your workload's running, that's the place I go to first. It's like, why is there so much time being spent inside the kernel? Um, so MP stat to understand if, if the system time is even a problem. Then assuming it is, I look at perf to get an understanding of, you know, what what is the kernel actually? That will turn up things like system call abuse. Um, 
right so w w what i actually do is i I, us I usually just you know go just with, with a simple time i just say time and then like my application and then i see the breakdown between you know the user space and the kernel space um and then it kind of tells me if my application spends too much time in the kernel space then i think then then i um then i you know go in the find, try to find ways how to how to uh, understand why it's 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 spending much time in the kernel do you think that's a kind of a reasonable strategy oh yeah 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 for sure um it's i, I was hoping to talk about this a little bit um i i, <laughs> I think that i think that that's like that makes total sense i can see why you do that um I, that tells me you work on compilers, <laughs> because and, you know, like that's not a bad thing. Um, you know what I what I mean by that is a lot of the time, especially for big workloads, is you don't have a clear stop and start, right? So sometimes you uh, I see, right. you you so like I mean, databases are a classic example of this, where the workload actually varies with time. So like in the start, maybe you're loading the data and your know, performance is fine, and then you hit a so you're doing lots of writes. And then you hit a read path for like 20 minutes. And at some point in that 20 minutes, performance tanks. And so you don't always have these clear cut um, start and stop where you can run time. Um, but if you can, that's a totally valid thing to do. Um, but NP start is my total choice just because usually I'm, I'm coming in somewhere in the middle or you know, before the, start, before the end and after the start. Right. Okay. Thanks. Yeah. So, uh, so you mentioned MP, uh, MP start and then perf. Well, obviously, uh, uh, what other tools uh, do you use? Like, for example, I know, like how how do you how, how do you observe uh, networking stack? How do you observe IO stack? Um, mm -hmm. Is it uh, and and by, and by the way, do you have to like frequently look into those kind of uh, issues like on on the in net networking and uh, and IO? We. We definitely look at um, IO stat output. Um, so that gives you things like disk utilization, you know, size of requests, length of the queues, and things like that, which is all good if, for a you know a, a IO intensive um, workload like databases. That's always good information to have. Um, for for other other stuff, I guess. It, I always have like a, a bag of tools, right? Like I, I learned this probably from reading Brendan Gregg's books. He, he makes this really fantastic point about, you know, it's good to have a knowledge of a wide range of tools, especially because you can um, use multiple tools t to um, figure out if they're saying the same thing. Like if there's any discrepancies between the values from two tools, you need to figure out why, um, because sometimes some tools claim to show you the same thing, like it's a tool that, that gives you the same thing, but will give you different values. And then that's usually good information to know um, and to figure out why. So I always have, I always try and have a lot of tools that I'm fairly comfortable with. And then I'll pick the tool based on, you know, what I hope is a methodical step through the problem space. So that's why I, I always start with MP start pretty much. If it's a kernel issue, if it's a CPU kernel issue, I'll look at perf. Um, if it looks like it's I/O bound, I'll look at I/O stat. If it's network, um, I had I, I've used SS before the, the, the socket tool and netstat. I recently found an issue where the the database wasn't reading from the socket, and so the the, the buffer the buffer queue was getting really really big, and you can detect that from from SS. Um, that wasn't the issue, but it led me to more stuff, right? So it was just a breadcrumb that led me further down the route I was going. Um, so all the networking tools are good. I, I would pretty much say you can use anything you know, right? Like, I don't think any tool's a bad tool. The more you know, the better. The only requirement is, is that you know how to use them and you understand what they're telling you. But if, if, you, if you know that and you know how to use them, then anything you want to use is, is great. I do a lot of um, post processing with said and arc, you know, and things like that, and I, I think that's totally fine. Um, schedule a latency, schedule a wake up latency analysis with said and arc, um, as opposed to Python or you know anything like that. Whatever you you know how to use, 
bring that, you know, when you're trying to investigate stuff. Um, because I do a lot of Java work now, um, I use things as simple as JStack, which for people who don't use Python, uh, Java just gives you the, the call stacks of the threads at a specific point in time. That can be really useful um, as a first approximation, particularly if you're debugging stuff on custom machines, right? So that's that's like a, a whole new, a whole other problem is when you don't have all your tools, you have to kind of get creative and use maybe the bare minimum. Uh, JSAC's a good one for, for analyzing what threads are doing. You know, I found, um, I recently did a blog post on a, a kernel bug but we didn't know it was a kernel bug at the time. We just had one of our tests, one of our, one of our overnight tests was timing out. And so I used like a, a pretty big list of tools on that. JSTAC was one of the, one of the, one of the threads was uh, just blocked, like indefinitely. Um, and then also, I'm a big fan of BPF, um, where, where and when I can use it. It's not suitable for everything, but I think it's very, it's very good for being able to answer questions about the kernel very quickly without requiring a reboot or anything like that. So that's definitely a tool worth looking at. Okay, cool. Yeah, BPF is a uh, you know is a is a completely uh, you know I mean different beast, and we can we can talk about it uh, in in in, uh, in 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 a minute. But uh, let's now um, let's talk about actually scheduling, and 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 I and and I wonder how. Um, and I wonder what are the the heuristics in the kernel, and maybe if you can name a few, and then how how those heuristics are maintained um, to support you know all the existing platforms, how all these you know uh, you know all these massive amounts of, of hardware, and you know and even even now when you know when when the hybrids uh, uh, systems. Um, so, so how those you know how those heuristics are maintained? Yeah, um, I think the the mainly not changed, right? In general, I would say that they they usually remain unchanged as new hardware comes out. You know, I it, it's difficult to talk in general. It's, that's not always true, um, as we saw with like the the, the ACPI slip problem, but. Like you said, the, the issue, the, the big issue the kernel has is it, it's kind of a, so the, the Linux kernel, I, I mean, particularly, it, it's kind of a victim of its own success, right? In, in the sense that it, it's so popular, it gets used in so many places, and a lot of the it still runs on all platforms, right? You can, you can take a brand new kernel and run it on like a 10 year old, maybe 15 year old, you know, distribution. And it, it should still work. Like I've seen people do things like that, and that's a lot of historical baggage to maintain. And so these heuristics, I, I, you know, you could totally trade off performance. I think it's, I think it would be fair to not perform as well as you did on on old hardware as you did at the time, so you can perform better on new hardware. I think that's a worthwhile trade off. But in terms of actually working and not like completely crippling old systems, a lot of this stuff doesn't get changed, or it, it gets changed so very. Um, minutely. So for the scheduler, I'm trying to rack my brain now. I've, I've thrown a lot of this out of my head in the last 12 months, but um, there, are, there, are, there are heuristics for deciding when to when to move tasks cr across sockets. There, there, I mean, there are several, actually. There's not just one. There's quite a few. The, the schedule is very complex. If, if for no other reason, then it, it has to deal with CPU topologies, right? But not just like x86 CPU topologies, like all of them across all the architectures. And a lot of them are very different. And so you you have the small, I say smaller ones. Traditionally, the, the embedded ones like ARM, but not really embedded anymore, I would say. <laughs> um, you know, up to like the, the power machines and things from IBM. And they, it all kind of has to work. And you want to have as much abstraction as possible but you you still need these kind of, these heuristics at some level to get good performance across like all of that, and scheduling tasks across CPUs is one that has a, a few of them. Um, there is one called the I forget the exact name. It's it's like the task buddy or something, or the um, the CFS buddy heuristic, which basically 
if you have a typical communication workload where you, let's say you have like two threads and they're just passing messages between each other if if the kernel was was omnipotent it, it, it would it would move those tasks together right like you you want them to go in the same socket at least but that is difficult for the kernel to infer and you have to kind of have a heuristic for that so we have a, a mechanism inside the kernel where you have like a counter that counts how many messages get passed backwards and forwards between two threads or like a pair of threads and if that counter gets so high the kernel decides that those threads should be on the same socket and then on the same um in the same l3 cache domain and then not on the same core oh no maybe on the same core yeah maybe on the same core because they're not doing work at the same time, right? And you, that's like the perfect way to do, to use a pair of hyper threads for that because you can sort of pass the work backwards and forwards and they're not running in parallel. Um, that, as you can imagine, that doesn't always work very well. And that gets, gets changed. I wouldn't say a lot, but that's, that's the kind of thing where people try and improve it and then usually it reverts back to the way it was before. Because it's difficult to do this stuff. It's difficult to improve these kind of checks whilst maintaining that backwards uh, backwards compatibility in terms of functionality. Um, I'm trying to think of some other ones. Um, yeah, the, the free cache one is, is a good one and something that I really took advantage of when I, I, I did some performance work where we, we ran a... This was before I was at Datastack, so we ran a database on KVM for the first time. So we virtualized the database workload for the first time for a customer. And um, actually, I, I, can, I can say this because I wrote, a, I wrote a, a technical guide for this and that's public. So it was SAP, the, the, database German, uh, the, the German database vendor. And they were moving their, their database to the cloud. And so they wanted to see what the performance was like for their database in the cloud versus running it on physical hardware on premise. And that was one where, because they were running on two socket machines, if you communicate to the to KVM to the, to the virtual machine, CPU topology, including L3 cache layout, you get improved performance because the kernel uses that information to decide where to move tasks on the system. Um, because if it knows that they can share an L3 cache, it makes sense to put them on CPUs that share an L3 cache. Right, as opposed to across the sockets, because then you incur less of a cost if you're passing data backwards and forwards. And you can actually expose that to KVM, um, though I forget <laughs> I forget the option for that. But if you were to search for it, I'm sure you'd find it. Okay. So uh, I, I, I wonder, uh, is, is there a place for, for machine learning, you know, models to, to, to you know, all those, all those complicated heuristics, like... What do you think? Yeah, I'm sure. Um, I'm sure. I mean, it, it doesn't even, as far as I know, it, it wouldn't even need to be, you know, state of the art machine learning. I'm not sure anyone's run um, like regression analysis or quantile analysis, uh, quantile regression analysis against all of the config options. I'm not sure. I mean, that may be an NP complete, I don't know. I'm not sure how long that would actually take because there's just so many options. It's unbelievable how many options the kernel has. But I don't think anyone's even done that. Right? So basically just tweaking the existing options and seeing which ones improve performance um, in sort of like an automated way. So for me, that would be the first uh, first step. I think you'd get good information from that. Um, but sure, yeah, I, I, I wouldn't rule out anything using machine learning to, to tune this, especially um, especially at runtime where maybe your workload isn't constant and you're serving you know, different um, different applications or different access patterns, then something like machine learning could be good. I, I personally never looked at it. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, and, and so, so you know, uh, now how... how... Uh, how the scheduler decides, you know, how the scheduler actually does its work in the presence of uh, of big little um, platforms. I want to give you a really balanced answer. I've got no idea. 
<laughs> okay. Sorry. Um, so I never, I never got to work on any of the, the stuff from ARM, the Bigwell stuff. Um, I was focused on Intel stuff and, and AMD things. Okay. Yeah, but now, now actually, so yeah, and so the the, the reason why I'm asking is is because like, uh, so the the first hybrid uh, Intel's product uh, comes out uh, on on November uh, this year. Oh, cool. Yeah, and so and, and so I was wondering, you know, uh, how 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 the schedule really you know works in 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 that kind of situation, so. Because, because I mean, you know, so well, so so you 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 obviously have to have to identify the compute intensive um, um, threads, and 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 that's that's not hard to, uh, and you should place them on the on the on the B core, on the uh, performance cores, right? And then the task that can run in the background, it can be it can be it can be done um, on the, on the small cores, but I, but I assume that it's not so easy. <laughs> And there are and there are you know a lot of situations where where there are a whole uh, you know many uh, compute intensive threads and and how how do you um, how how do you prioritize in that kind of situation? But, yeah, I, okay. I, I think from what I've seen, I, I followed the development a little bit, um, and one thing I will say is that it seems to be <laughs> it's been going on forever, you know. So I, I think what we can infer from that is that. This, uh, you know, like homogeneous CPUs, that assumption is basically built in, it baked into the kernel, right? And there's a bunch of stuff in the scheduler that, that kind of needs to be undone um, in order to, to support this, you know, heterogeneous configuration of CPUs. Um, because it seems like they've been working on the big little support architecturally, it's like supporting new CPUs, but like the concept of having. CPUs with different processing capacities for for years, um, and I think that was just such a fundamental part of the OS that it took. It's taken a long time to kind of un unwire all that and, and build something better. Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. Okay, and then and then actually, so one question I also was interested in is that so we mentioned you know uh, different different. Uh, uh, Different Linux distros, right? Um, so uh, I wonder how uh, how do you, do you have a feeling like how how they how they compete in terms of performance? And then if if yes, then I wonder uh, what contributes to that difference in performance. So if if we take for example Ubuntu and I don't know and maybe like Red Hat or 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 like you know or or, or like whatever other distro you wanna you you are f familiar with. Yeah. Um, well, I worked at SUSE, so <laughs> I'm going to say okay. I'm going to say SUSE. Um, I think there are definitely differences in performance. Um, I I I don't know for sure. I can I can guess a few of my personal opinions about why why there's a difference and why some may work better for specific situations than others. I guess. This is, this is just my personal opinion and um, you know, my, my ideas, my guesses, basically. Um, so some of it, even though this is like, even though this is um, you know, open source software here, some of it is definitely driven by customers, right? So customer requirements and needs and the, situ the, the scenarios in which those operating systems are generally deployed, that's, that's going to have some bearing on which parts of the kernel, uh, which parts of kernel performance are important to the distributions? Um, because if, uh, apart from, I mean, not all of the not all of the operating systems for sure, but a lot of them have got commercial backers, right? And that does have a direct effect on the pure open source versions. Um, so I would definitely say the the commercial entity attached to like a pure open source just, uh, OS is going on what that OS thinks is important for performance. Also, um, the kernel developers working at the commercial um, at the commercial company that are the, are behind an open source operating system, that's also got some influence on it. So when when I worked at SUSE, I, I was focused on the scheduler full time. You know, obviously, I, I made sure that the schedule performed really well for the things that we were testing 
on Susan's Enterprise product, but also open Susan too. Um, that's bit mainly because of you know the area I was, I was interested in and, and the work I did on the upstream kernel, and so I can. My guess would be that that's true uh, all the other open systems too. Uh, you know, and I guess that would extend to even if you're not paid by a a commercial operating system vendor, you know, wh whatever your interests are for performance, that's what you're going to look at. That's what you're going to focus on and improve. So that that's just got to have some bearing on it. Um, that's probably the big two, I would have thought. Like, who, who's working on it? Um, so, I mean, I've already, I've already said how much I have on benchmarking and performance analysis, and so we did a huge amount of that when I was at SUSE. Um, and we had very strong opinions about which benchmarks were good, which benchmarks were not good. Um, that sometimes explained why OpenSUSE didn't perform so well in some of the big benchmarking tests. Like um, Veronix is a good example of this. Sometimes, not always, but sometimes when OpenSUSE performance was worse than other operating systems for a benchmark that was run, you know, we had a reason for that. Like, either we thought the benchmark was crap, or you know, we we made that that engineering trade off between something, right? Um, based on what we were interested in, what a lot of our customers, I mean, you know, users too, right? What users ran open source for, and that had a bearing on how things performed. I don't know if that's that's the kind of answer you're expecting. That's just my best guess. That's, that, that, that's okay. Sure. I mean, yeah, I, I completely understand that. Yeah. So different, different distros, uh, targeting different, different use cases. Completely um, understandable. But uh, and then, at the risk of starting, you know, a new rant. I, but but at the same time, I can't help but ask, <laughs> uh, how how you know how Windows compare compares to Linux, and Mac OS as well in terms of performance. <laughs> I can make this with, I've got no idea. <laughs> Absolutely no idea. I, I mean, as as you would guess, like I only run Linux um, mainly because if things break, I know I can fix them. Um, I, yeah, I've got no idea. Do you know? Uh, no, not really. I, I, I just you know, uh, just just wanted to ask what what are your thoughts? I, well, I mean, th there are rumors that you know that, that Linux faster. Uh, at least in Windows, but, but those are just rumors. I haven't seen any any you know kind of uh, a good study on 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 that. Yeah, it definitely. If you if you find anything, let me know. I'd be interested to read that. Um, you know, it's totally possible. I, I I would be very interested to see how those comparisons went. Sure. All right. Um, now uh, we ha we have some time to talk about the BPF, and uh, let's. Let's dig into that. So I, I so this is actually the, the area where I know uh, like really little. So so can you can can you can you explain uh, what is the BPF and how you can use BPF for performance uh, in 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 your performance work? Yeah. Um, so BPF is basically an in kernel virtual machine. So when I say virtual machine, I mean like the Java virtual machine, right? So it's an in-kernel um, uh, method of running scripts that can access kernel structures and kernel uh, functions, but where the code that you inject comes from user space. So what this is really good for, like a, a trivial example where this is cool is um, timing the kernel function, right? So, so, so say you know... A kernel function you're interested in, you can insert hooks at the start of the function and then the exit of the function and work out the time difference. And you don't need to, you you, you compile the um, the script against the kernel headers, but you don't need to reboot the kernel. You don't need to run custom a custom kernel to do this. You can do this on any modern um, distribution. It's a really easy and low overhead way to run custom kernel code, I guess is the is the the, the, the one sentence tagline. Mm -hmm. So 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 the flow is like this. So so someone uh, so for, for example, you are a, 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 
maintainer of of a uh, Linux, let's say, distro or or, or not, not Linux distro, or you are like like providing the uh, like um, the uh, this BPF program which you wrote, right? Uh, for and, and you deploy that BPF program on 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 like uh, all the all the fleet in in, in or for example on 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 some server, right? Uh, and you. Um, so this is kind of extending the the kernel uh, observability, uh, right? And and then so you provided to me this BPF program, and then I can extract some information from the kernel, right? Is this is this how 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 it works? Yeah, that's exactly how it works. So what what happens is you have basically a shared data structure between between the user space and the kernel. And there are Python bindings for accessing these. It's just a um, just a dictionary, I think. I forget. <laughs> I think it's just a dictionary in Python that where you declare it inside of some C code that you inject into the kernel, and then both the kernel and then your Python script can access this data structure that talks seamlessly between the two. And so that's how you can pull out things like timings that you've stuffed into the um, the map inside of the kernel. You pull them out in your Python script, and then run wherever you want to do with them in you. But so I, I wonder, so so uh, if I am if I'm a user, right, and I run my user user space application, then um, I only will be able to use those BPF programs that are already loaded in the kernel, or I can I can load them myself. If you have if you have permission, I mean, you you can't it, you can't have loading the programs, right? Because th though though the virtual machine inside the kernel is restricted in, in a few sen in a few senses, it's still elevated code, right? You know, you're still running code inside of the kernel, even though there are some restrictions. And so you have to have mm -hmm. like permission to inject stuff into the kernel. I, I can't remember what the I, I don't I don't know what the capability is called, but let's just assume it's like root or something. You know, you have to be root. Um, mm -hmm. In order to insert modules, but you you can certainly insert them at runtime dynamically whenever you want and unload them too. Okay, okay, that makes sense to me. Uh, so, so and and this is like common that that you know that for example, like uh, like I'm exposing my my you know, environment to to the user in which they run their applications. I may have you know some some uh, like um, essentially i have a set of bpf programs that i provide to to my users right so that they can uh extract various information from the kernel right is is, is that how how the how people usually uh use bpf um yeah i'm i'm not sure that the way around that you you explain it is the common one so so it's for people that that run the servers you know, on the platform to get information or analyze stuff it is is the common way I've seen this done. So I've used it, for example, to see the breakdown of CPU time, I/O time for a for a process, which sounds very similar to MPSAT, and it, it is very similar to MPSAT, except that I I stole a trick from I think one of Brendan Gregg's scripts, and it actually breaks down the time by kernel call stacks. So you don't just get I/O time; you get like network I/O time and file system I/O time, which is really useful. Um, but that's, like I said, mainly from the platform owner's perspective. You know, you want to know how maybe maybe a user deployed an application on your platform, and you want to know how your platform is performing. Okay, so this is kind of extending extending the the current uh, uh, capabilities. The, the, Tracing capabilities inside the kernel, which are already hard hard coded into the kernel, right? So we have we have all those you know tools like S trace, which can trace the system calls. So that's the tracing that is already there in the in the kernel. You cannot take away from it un, unless you recompile the kernel, right? But this is but BPF is kind of extending that, right? I can I can uh, create my own tracing uh, routines, right? I can trace like some different uh, events. That that are not uh, and 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 different different events. I mean, um, that that trigger only w with a specific let's say condition, right? Yep. Uh, which are which which are not yet uh, hard coded in the in the kernel, right? In in the, in the kernel code. Yeah. 
All right, and then so so the other question I have is that uh, so you said that this is this is used for a local debugging. So it's just a it's just a way for for me to you know. Uh, um, so, so you said I don't need to recompile the kernel, so that's great. So that's, uh, uh, but on the on the other hand, right? So if I am the the uh, debugging my my program, uh, I can I can write this BPF program instead of instead of recompiling the the kernel, right? So the, the, that's the advantage uh, again. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, you can figure a lot of stuff mm -hmm. out. You know. It gets that this. I guess there's three main areas where BPF gets used. It's uh, observability, so for stuff like this, um, so yeah, networking. And I will admit that I don't know a huge amount about security and networking for BPF. Um, just that it's very popular. I mean, networking is where it came from, right? Originally, that's where the history is. Um, is that people were able to so sidestep a lot of the network in the Linux kernel and get programs instead and get fantastic performance gains, particularly where there was unnecessary work happening inside of the Linux kernel network stack. And like for, for a specific application they were running, they didn't need to do that, you know, unparsing all the header and stuff like that. Um, so they, they wrote BPF programs to bypass a lot of that, run the BPF program like at the, um, let's say like network device driver entry point, process it user space quickly and then send it back. And they, they, they got really the performance from that. Um, but definitely my, personally, Observability is, is the place where I use the most. The place where I get the most value from it. All right, but uh, so and and then I wonder. So how people use this those BPF programs uh, for performance observability? Uh, observability. Yeah. Um, so I I wrote one. Which I, I talked a little bit about. It, it, it's a reimplementation of time actually. So the time command you talked about, I wrote a version of that uses BPF. Which you might think, well, why on earth did you want to do that? And the reason is, BPF, uh, sorry, the time command only uses the metrics exported by the kernel, right, to, to work out mm -hmm. the amount of time spent in the kernel in the application. Um, but what I did instead was I calculated the time inside the kernel myself, and then broke it down by cost call stack when. Um, when the time was calculated. So it worked out as a percentage when you run a command, how much time did it spend off the CPU, which is something that time doesn't give you. So off CPU is like block time. So if you're blocked waiting for know, network IO, it, it would tell you the percentage of time spent waiting for network IO. And then the percentage of time waiting for file IO and, and things like that. I also had like time spent doing kernel locking which is just, you don't get that, right? Apart, uh, even, you, you can get it in perf, but not if you sleep, because it's not, it doesn't churn CPU cycles. So it's things like that where it, maybe it's difficult to do in a generic way, and if you have a specific case where you, where you want to do something like that, BPF is excellent, because you can implement the custom stuff for the kernel you've always wanted, but couldn't, you know, never got a chance to do. I know, I, I know that Google have written like a, I think it was Google, have written a, a, a scheduler in using BPF that runs in, in user space because there's no way they could have got that into the kernel. People have tried before. And just the, 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 it's very difficult to get new scheduler models inside of the, not models, you know, scheduler configurations inside of the classes. That's the word, scheduler classes inside of the kernel. Um, so BPF, Opens up this whole, the whole, opens up the kernel completely to write this kind of custom stuff, and not require it to be part of the kernel source code. No, oh, that's 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 that that actually sounds really powerful. So I can I can even uh, you know overwrite uh, and and write my own scheduler, right? Yeah, yeah. There are definitely limitations to it. So I said it's a subversion machine. You can't write sort of like arbitrary memory addresses because that would be a scary nightmare. You know, you have to pull in addresses and work with them on the the the, uh, the BPS stack and stuff like that. But it's still an incredibly powerful uh, program. Yeah, cool. So it's not only only you know as as like you're writing like hooks for 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 different events. It's just also like uh, um, you can you can completely re rewrite parts of your of your uh, of your of your kernel stack. So that's 
that's that's cool. That's cool. Uh, Matt, I uh, yeah, I use uh, Brendan Gregg's uh, BPF tools extensively, and I, I haven't had a hundred uh, situation where I had to write my own. Are your uh, custom eBPF tools available publicly? I've only really. Apart from apart from sort of bugging stuff, I've only really got the one, which is Shed Time, which, yeah, that is available. Um, it's on my GitHub page, but if you can't find it, you know, message me after Mark and I'll, I'll let you know where it is. Okay, thanks. And I will, I will echo what, okay. what Mark said, that Brendan, Brendan Gregg's, you know, collection of tools is, is excellent and definitely should be everybody's first part of call for, you know, for BF in, in all kinds of ways. Cool. That's great. Uh, I think I don't have any more questions for uh, regarding BPF. If if anyone wants to wants to like you know um, if anyone have more questions regarding BPF, then then that's the good time to to ask. Uh, if not, then I we, we actually have a few questions in the chat. Let me let me go there. Uh, so so Matt Chad asks, uh, how many Linux applications could benefit from using Splice instead of Reed? Do you have a, a thought on that? Um, not really. It's a, it's a fair question. I, I, I don't know. I'm sorry. OK. Let me, let me ask one more question uh, from the chat. So the, the person called Mariusz um, asks, is there any sense to manually try kernel performance in context of Java workload? For example, to get better garbage collection or rather operating system auto-tune capabilities are so great that it is not necessary in most cases and we should focus on Java parameters. Generally, the question is connected to his point of main focus during tuning this kind of workload. Yeah, I... That's a good question. I, I I haven't personally done much tuning for the kernel for Java workloads. I know that if you're having issues with um, post from garbage collection, some somebody that I, I talked to on Twitter um, has suggested looking at tuning transparent huge pages. Uh, I haven't done that personally, but I I can you know from that I can assume that there is still kernel stuff that needs to be tuned for Java. Um, I have mainly only looked at tuning um, Java and time parameters like, like the garbage collector. Um, but I know this is a bit of a non-answer. I, I would have some benchmarks and try both. That's definitely true. Okay, so so uh, so in, in in the beginning you were uh, you were talking about you know the, the benefit of using. Uh, you know, uh, both macro uh, and micro benchmarks. So, so what are those, those benefits? So, the for, so for those that don't know, micro benchmark is, is intended to be a test that measures the performance of a really small piece of code, usually on like the function level or maybe even like a few statements or instructions. Macro benchmark is a much bigger version of that, where normally you test something that's closer to like a user workload. Um, and so they have different uses in the sense that ultimately I think that if I could only pick one, I would pick like a macro benchmark. So to me, user, user workloads and customer workloads is the only thing that really matters, right? Like if, if, if users get better performance, that's what matters. If it goes down, that's bad, and then fix it. So that's where the macro benchmarks come in. It's something that's quite large. For, for databases, you're looking at like running something for like 30 minutes or an hour, right? That's like a, a minimum for a, a macro benchmark. Um, but micro benchmarks, I think, are more, um, more focused on optimization. So though I talked about the, the, the micro benchmark that caught the, uh, the loop stream detector bug, um, in general, I think they are tools for guiding you towards optimizations. And so if you have a really critical piece of code that's in the hot path for your application, you, you really want to be sure that that always performs really, really well. And micro benchmarks are perfect for that kind of stuff. 
they do get abused a little bit. If you start using them for something that isn't performance critical, that's when you start get running into trouble because you, you make decisions based off the results of micro benchmark that either can't be detected by the users or they don't affect them in any way. Um, but as a means of understanding the performance of critical, small critical pieces of, of your application, I think micro benchmarks are essential. Cool. So the bottom line is that uh, micro benchmarks should be used only for uh, for guiding you towards the fixing the real issue in the micro benchmark. Is 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 that correct? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I never thought about that, but that's you're right. That's kind of what I said. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Cool. Uh, yeah, I I I agree. I agree. That's uh, that that is true. All right, so so since this is today is Sunday, and let's uh, let's maybe uh, you know uh, do not talk about performance. Uh, I mean, I mean about uh, technical things any, anymore. Uh, let's talk about performance culture for teams. How do you how do you make people care about performance? Um, yeah, that's a, that's that's a tough question. Um, I when when I worked in worked on teams where maybe usually when I've cared about performance, I've worked on performance teams. So the team's kind of been fine, but communicating the value of the team to the company or the division um, usually comes down to like customer happiness, use or user happiness, you know, losing, losing users because of poor performance or gaining customers because of improved performance is the way that I usually phrase it. Um, then on sort of like a smaller scale, I've worked with other developers that maybe weren't as experienced doing performance work. Because I, I don't think, you know, not to be disrespectful, I don't think any, any of the stuff that we do as performance engineers is rocket science, but I do think that you need a certain methodology and methodical approach to doing performance work. And it's very, very easy especially if you're not experienced at doing it, it's very easy to come out of that methodical approach and, and start ch ch changing too many things at once. And, and so most of the value that I think I've brought to other people is just slowly going from step to step, right? And not wandering off into the weeds about something, collecting data at every point to guide the next step, which, is, which sounds really simple. And, and it, it is simple, but it's not easy because it's really... Um, it's really tempting to to go and change you know, all kinds of stuff or change this thing that somebody told you about two months ago, you know, that's terrible. Um, and so I think that in terms of performance culture, that's that for me, that's been the biggest um, the biggest benefit I think I've brought is to people who, who were interested in performance or who were doing some performance work was just trying to take it one step at a time and methodically going through the process of well, let's collect some data and then use that to guide the next step and not jump steps unless you're absolutely certain that, you know, you can skip a bit. I just want to... Okay. Uh, uh, yeah, go, 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 go ahead, Mark. Sure, sure, yeah. Um, go I, I just want to say, uh, after Matt's comment that he doesn't think performance engineering is rocket science, I used to... I, Maybe ten years ago, I may have agreed with him, but but once once automated, once it became uh, part of the culture to have automated performance regression testing to do pass fail and CI/CD pipelines, once that became a popular thing, I think I kind of changed my opinion that it is kind of rocket science because uh, I never realized until that became so powerful how much about statistics you have to know to do that well. And when you see people do it incorrectly and you see how there's such a, a lack of knowledge of, of some of the foundational principles around uh, statistical testing, then to me, it became closer to rocket science than it did before like 10 years ago. I don't know how you feel about that, Matt, but that's just my response to that comment. Yeah, I think that's fair. Um, I, I I would kind of, Break, break the performance stuff down into two buckets, right? So I definitely see the statistical method side of it as like a as like the responsibility of maybe 
performance engineers, like dedicated performance engineers to provide us tools. So you're right that some of the statistical stuff is is tricky and certainly it none of this gets taught, right? Like I've I've never I've only ever I've only come across this stuff from talking to other performance engineers or people or mathematicians. And um doing doing all regression analysis and um statistical significance detection and things like that is definitely tricky, but I see that as a separate problem and something that people should work on to provide tools to other engineers to perform this analysis. I don't know. I mean, we, we do that at data stacks, right? So one of the nice things is, which I think is probably different from other companies is that the tools are worked on by a small group of people, but then individual teams that don't work on the tools use them to do their performance analysis. And so it, you really have to make them intuitive to use, use them in specific, use them, right, of use of, scenarios but then also you do expect a certain level of maturity from the users that they know when those tools align to them which always happens with, with statistics um but i still think that that's a separate responsibility to build the tools and people building tools need to know this stuff but i don't think it's fair to make everybody else need to know all that too that's kind of what i meant by it's not rocket science Hey, Matt, um, thank you for taking my question here. What is your take on microservices with this, you know, onslaught of the microservices everywhere happening? How do you factor in performance? Yeah, um, that's, a, that's interesting. I, I think that performance for microservices needs to be built in layers. So... What I mean by that is the, the whole thing about microservices is, is it's an organizational hack, right? Like that's, it's not really technology. It's, it's an organizational um, discipline, I guess, where individual teams responsible for the things they produce, they get integrated by other teams. And so I think that a layered approach to performance is, is kind of essential for that in, in the sense that the team should be doing, you know, if I get my way, micro benchmarks and then macro benchmarks for the thing that they're, for the microservice that they're, releasing um and then once those are released obviously because it's a comp it then becomes a complex system you need performance testing again right all the pieces together um and so that's that's my take on performance testing micro uh, services i've got a couple of papers on this that i haven't yet read they're, they're in my ever-growing uh paper to uh, to read pile but that's kind of how i would approach this thank you So Matt, so you, you were talking about this, uh, you know, uh, all those uh, st statistical tools. So do you think that that you know, uh, do you think that, that we should we should actually so for performance engineers, do you think that it's uh, we should teach uh, engineers how to really you know benchmark and you know and how to statistically analyze the results, or it's rather better to focus on building tools that will abstract all the knowledge away and then just you know give the like uh give give the result um i think i think probably both right because we i i think we definitely need more people building tools and talking about statistical methoding like mark said you know automated regression detection um but at the same time it's not scalable to have everybody care about that in the same way that you know though i use compilers i'm not a compiler engineer um, and I find it absolutely fascinating. And I've, I've worked on compilers a little bit, but I still don't think that I'm a compiler engineer. And yet the amount of stuff that you need to know to build a good one, it is vast, right? There's a lot to it. It's, it's an entire discipline by itself. And so I think this balanced approach where for some people that are building tools, yeah, we need better education because I've never seen the stuff that, that Mark's talking about and that, that, that we use, I've never seen any of that discussed. Um, it's, it's pretty heavy uh, statistical stuff. But at the same time, you know, we can't have everybody knowing that. I, I think a, a, a general performance is enough and, and a performance analysis is probably enough. But that's changed, right? That's changed in the past, few, past decade or so because of the indeterminism in systems now, most of the time, not always, you know, but most can't use things like the mean. 
Um, it, ve- it really, really depends on the data. And that doesn't get, it, it gets talked about a bit, but I, I wouldn't, it gets talked about a bit sort of in performance circles, right? And I'm talking about like the people that just want to measure the performance of their application and then go do other stuff that are not necessarily concerned about working on performance all day, every day, but just want to make sure they're not making bad decisions. And I think that we need to improve the education there um, to talk about, you know, robust methods of of, of um, detecting typical values and stuff like that, but they're not the full on slaughter of doing, you know, hardcore mathematics. Cool. Yeah, I agree. Um, okay, Matt. Well, that's uh, that's been great. Uh, having you and be- before we let you go uh, do you have any any book uh, podcast or other recommendations uh, how do you how do you educate yourself what resources are you using um, I buy books to, I buy like computer science textbooks and, and software engineering textbooks based on recommendations from colleagues and friends um, I don't know that I've got a specific one I, I just I'm always buying them and then not reading them for like six months um, and then picking them up <laughs> I, the, the main way that I keep up to date, I guess, is, is Twitter. Like, Twitter is a phenomenal um, platform for, for hearing about the latest things, projects people are working on. I mean, as we all know, it's also a bit of a hellhole, but it does have its good moments. And I think that reaching out to, you know, to, to most people on this space, actually, <laughs> you know, seeing what they're working on, what they're up to, is really helpful for me. Um, I follow a lot of and research um, conferences and and papers and stuff like that and I find that very useful for for keeping up to date also what I I sometimes end up doing is like digging into a a new area and um, research papers are fantastic for that and and looking through past years of conferences okay cool uh, any any last uh, last uh, comments from from the audience? Last questions. Thank you. Somebody just. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. Go. This has been amazing and thoroughly enjoyed. Uh, full disclosure, I worked with Matt, um, but it was lovely hearing him here and going through the details. Thank you, Matt, and others. Thanks, Mishka. All right, and. Uh, uh, last question, Matt. Where people can find you online? Uh, so I'm Fleming underscore Matt on Twitter. Um, and then on GitHub, I'm M Fleming. And I also run a, a blog that has been updated in a while, but it has some articles on it, which is uh, codeblueprint.co.uk. Cool. Uh, Thanks. Last, last chance for, for, for the audience. Uh, Pierre, you, you yep. uh, requested the mic. Yeah. Hey, everyone. Um, so, yeah, I just wanted to add one point about what uh, Matt said about BPF being used for observability of a, a full platform. It's also preserved the JVM itself by instrumenting its code. So it's not really limited to the kernel. Um, I did use it to trace some uh, humanization in Java in one of our um, database components. Uh, so, yeah, I definitely recommend looking into that. Um, and I can probably share a, a, a link to one or two blog posts that, that explains this in, in further details. Yeah, that sounds awesome. Okay. Yeah, I, didn't, I didn't know that that, that was uh, possible, but I, I could definitely use that. Oh, yeah, yeah. You can instrument the, the, the GC code itself and see where and why it, or why it spends most of its time in certain area. It's, it's pretty nice. Okay, well, Matt, it's been great uh, talking to you today, and thanks uh, for uh, for uh, all the questions from the audience. Uh, thanks to to all of you guys. Um, I hope uh, you had a wonderful uh, and interesting and insightful conversation. Uh, and uh, yeah, uh, see you in two weeks, and uh, happy performance tuning. Thanks, everyone. Bye, bye.